It appears that we are officially live. Great. Hello, everybody, and uh, welcome to another session of our Sussex Vision Seminar Series, as always, within the Worldwide Neuro Initiative. I am George Cafetzis, a master's graduate from Thomas Euler's lab, and currently uh, a PhD student with Tom Baden. As your host for today, I would like to once again begin by thanking Tim Vogels and Panos Bozelos for putting forward this uh, ever-expanding initiative towards a greener uh, and much more accessible seminar world. Having said that, allow me, of course, to get back to the reason we all gathered here for today and introduce our guest from Northwestern University, Professor Greg Schwarz. Following his uh, dual bachelor's degree in computer science and neuroscience, as well as a master's degree in neuroscience at Brandeis University, Greg joined Princeton and the lab of Michael Berry for his PhD, focusing on retinal ganglion cells, RGCs, and identifying how they anticipate certain patterns and how they signal uh, violations of them. In 2009, he joined as a postdoctoral fellow the lab of Frederike at the University of Washington, where he worked on uh, retinal gain uh, mechanisms, encoding of natural inputs, and characterization of uh, receptive fields. In 2013, he moved to Northwestern University and has been located there uh, ever since, nowadays holding the title of Associate Professor in the Ophthalmology uh, Department. In his lab, they primarily seek to understand retinal computations using the mouse as a model. They have created a wonderful repository for retinal ganglion cell types, uh, rgctypes.org, that includes uh, morphological, functional, and gene expression information for its type. And uh, last but definitely not least, Greg has recently wrote a fantastic book, uh, Retinal Computation. You don't see it here because my window is blurry, but you see it right behind Greg. Uh, so today we will be hearing about their latest and I'm sure exciting findings in his talk entitled Functional Divergence at the Mouse Bipolar Cell Terminal. So without any further ado from my side, please all welcome Professor Schwartz. Greg, the stage is officially uh, all yours. Thank you so much, George. That was a wonderful introduction. Let me make sure this is shared. Oh, wrong, wrong screen sharing, right? Let's see. Yes. Okay, let's see if I can share the right screen. Sorry about that. All right, better? Sharing yep, the right yep. screen? Okay. To go. I am I'm thrilled to be here again. So I, I was at one of these Worldwide Neuro talks back near the beginning of the pandemic in 2020. And at that time, it was a new thing and we were starting this up. And since then, all the organizers have done such an incredible job at having so many amazing vision science speakers. I've seen a lot of them. There's a backlog of ones I still need to watch on YouTube, but you guys have done a wonderful job and it's been a great way to connect this community virtually while we haven't been able to see each other in person. Hopefully, I'm really excited to see some of you in person soon. So that's gonna be really exciting. Arvo's coming up in three weeks or four weeks. So I'm gonna see some of you in Denver, hopefully. And then hopefully I'll see more of you at FASEB as well in the summer. So it'll be great to finally see each other in person again. Today, I made sure I talk about something different than I did last time. So today I'm gonna to tell you a story about functional divergence of the mouse bipolar cell terminal. And this is something we've been working on for quite a number of years now, and it's a collaboration with Rachel Long. And it's really part of the reason we've been working on it for so many years is because we arrived at some very uncomfortable conclusions. So I'm gonna hopefully share that discomfort with you as we get there together. But first, just to introduce myself and my lab briefly, for those of you who don't know, we're kind of ever expanding in the number of things we do because I don't know how to say no to any new interesting idea. So we don't just, we're not just a retina lab anymore. We are a lab that works on neurobiology and computation in the early visual system. And that involves levels from neuronal biophysics, which I'm not gonna talk about today, but we're working on sodium channels and dendrites and stuff like that, to retinal circuits, to retinal ganglion cell types, which is kind of our bread and butter, as George was mentioning, we put out that website for the types in the mouse. But now our lab is also working on brain projections of each of those types to the many different targets in the brain and social behavior in mice actually. So here are, here's our setup of mice walking around and interacting with each other with uh, vision only. 
So today's story is going to kind of move backwards down this tree. Started retinal ganglion cell types, move backward into the circuits that serve them, and we're going to end with some questions about biophysics in bipolar cells. So broadly, outside the retina now, in my view, there's two related, really ubiquitous questions in systems neuroscience that you can ask at, in almost any circuit you might study. Where in a neural circuit does a computation take place? Can you put your finger on the spot? And what's the relevant computational unit? Is it the cell? Is it the dendrite? Is it the synapse? Is it the ion channel? What is the computational unit that's doing the math that's happening in this circuit? Um, the vertebrate retina has been a fantastic model system for this. This is something preaching to the choir for those of you who are retinal neuroscientists. You know that it's such an exciting system because we can answer these questions in great detail in this circuit. So a few examples are, of course, well-known direction selectivity, one of the best understood circuits in systems neuroscience. The circuit location at which that happens is inhibitory currents from starburst amacrine cells to the DSGCs. And the computational unit is not the starburst amacrine cell, it is the neurites of it, because different neurites on different sides of the starburst amacrine cell compute different directions. Orientation selectivity is another computation that we worked on in my lab, actually. For the off-OS RGCs, the circuit location turns out surprisingly to be an electrical synapse with RGCs, a gap junction. And the computational unit is the neurites of this common amacrine cell that we discovered or we rediscovered in mass. Um, motion anticipation is another famous computation. Feed forward inhibition onto RGC dendrites can do that. Therefore, the computation takes place in the RGC dendritic tree or parts of it. A lot of people have worked on this. Michael Berry has a famous old paper on this. Leon Lagnato's lab had an excellent paper in 2015 that showed the ubiquity of this circuit in different places. So these are just a few examples. There's many more. But one of, turns out, one of the most familiar, most famous retinal computations at all is surround suppression. And we don't actually know the circuit location of that necessarily. Where is surround suppression computed for a particular ganglion cell type in the mouse retina? You may read the textbooks and you may say, it's horizontal cells do surround suppression. They do some, depends on the species. And, if it was really true that horizontal cells were just creating surround suppression for the whole retina, wouldn't ganglion cells have the same amount of surround suppression all because the feedback is onto the cones themselves? But that's not the case. So I'm going to answer these questions. Where is surround suppression computed for a particular ganglion cell type, and two types actually, in the mouse retina? And what is the computational unit? So first, let me just introduce the team. This, is, this project has been entirely led and excellently performed by David Swigard in my lab, who's a senior PhD student, who's done an incredible array of different techniques here. So you'll see lots of different kinds of recordings and analysis, and that's all David really. And then our collaborators at UW, Wan Cheng and Rachel, have worked on some kind of amazing EM reconstructions that I'll show you. Just so we're on the same page, most of you know this, I'll speed through this slide, but we use mouse, we dark adapt the mice overnight, we dissect them in darkness using night vision goggles, and then we present visual stimuli with a digital light projector. And we perform electrophysiology, both cell attached and whole cell, where we can do voltage clamp, current clamp, and dynamic clamp, which I'm gonna show you some dynamic clamp recordings today. And for imaging, post recording the cells, we can do light microscopy, either two photon or confocal. And today I'm also gonna show you some EM that we've done with Rachel. Okay, so first let me introduce the players in this drama today, which are the PIX on and the on alpha RGCs. So these cells are definitely functionally and molecularly distinct types. I'm not gonna go through all the proof of that, but it's definitely true that these are different cell types, but they're anatomically similar in ways that I'm gonna show you in a moment. 
Odd alphas are, of course, very well-studied cells. They're known to project to DLGN, where they participate in contrast sensitivity. They're also, they also have melanopsins, so they participate in absolute light detection. Pixon RGCs are not as well-known, or were discovered more recently in 2018 by Daniel Kirschensteiner's lab. And their role in behavior remains unclear, although they are overrepresented in the ipsilateral projecting part where they may have something to do with prey capture from another one of Daniel's more recent papers. So as you can see functionally, the responses of these two cells to a 200 micron spot are shown and they're both on sustained cells. You might see some slight differences in their spike amplitudes, but basically that's a pretty similar pattern of activity to the 200 micron spot shown right there. But now what happens when we have a 12 micro, 1200 micron spot? Now there's a major difference, right? The on alpha still fires at a very high rate and the picks on does not. So quantifying this, if we look at spike count as a function of spot diameter, you can see picks on RGCs have what we would call very high surround suppression and on alpha RGCs have very low surround suppression. So the rest of this talk is gonna be figuring out where that happens. So this is kind of the diagram we're gonna use throughout. We've got our two RGCs at the bottom and we wanna know where in this circuit do we see this difference in surround suppression. Okay, so let's start at the bottom and we're gonna work our way backwards up. And we're just gonna test different hypotheses along the way. So what if su the suppression difference is from the synaptic conductances or what if it's from the intrinsic properties of the ganglion cells? So neural computation is controlled both by the inputs to the cell and by the cell's own ion channels and intrinsic properties. So how can we dissociate those two? So either excitation and inhibition are critical for this or the excitability of the cells themselves and their voltage gated channels are important or some of both. These aren't mutually exclusive, of course. So let's measure those things. So again, here's the spike suppression in a population of pixons and on alphas. Oh, and by the way, I'll keep this color scheme throughout. So the pixons will be purple and the on alphas will be orange throughout the talk. And again, here's the surround suppression, their spiking activity. But now let's look at it in excitation and inhibition. So instead of showing this whole curve every time, I'm going to summarize it by this suppression index which is the peak response minus the full field response over their sum. And the suppression index, like I said, very high for pixons, very low for on alpha. So there's the spiking data, population data. Here's the excitation data. So now when we're, we record excitatory currents in these cells flipped over as conductances here, we see a very similar pattern to the spiking activity. Pixon RGCs have a lot of surround suppression in their excitation, on alphas have very little in their excitation. What about inhibition? We see an interesting, a very different pattern here. And this is, this is kind of a replication of a lot of the stuff that was in Daniel's paper as well, which is that on alphas have some surround suppression of their inhibition, but pixons just have inhibition that gets larger and larger as the spot size gets larger. So while that, the way we defined it in suppression index, that's a negative suppression index. However, it's inhibition. So you can kind of flip the sign, right? Both larger inhibition and smaller excitation for large spots would support fewer spikes. So both the excitatory and inhibitory conductances in pixons at least qualitatively appear to be in the direction where they would support surround suppression. But that's not a quantitative answer to whether the conductances or the, the conductances in, that the cells are receiving or their ion channels are critical in causing this computation. So to actually dissociate those two things, we can use dynamic lamp. So we use these conductances that we recorded and we feed them back into the cells. And the trick there is that we can swap the cells. Right, we can record the conductances from a pixon and play them into a pixon, and we should get about the same spiking output, but we can also play them into an on alpha and vice versa. So before I show you the data, actually, sorry, I skipped ahead. Let's just go over what the predictions would be. If 
the surround suppression was controlled by the ion channels in the cells themselves. The identity of the cell should control surround suppression, right? Whereas if it's controlled by the conductances, the identity of the conductances should control surround suppression. The answer is very clear. Surround suppression is controlled by the identity of the conductances, not the identity of the cells. So on the x-axis here, we're looking at conductances from a pixon versus conductances from an on alpha, and the different colored points are injected conductances into a pixon versus an on alpha. So in other words, when you inject pixon conductances, you get surround suppression, regardless of which cell type you're injecting them into. And when you inject on alpha conductances, you don't, regardless of which cell you're injecting them into. So we can put our first X on the board. Surround suppression follows the identity of the synaptic conductances rather than the identity of the RGC itself. Okay, and both excitation and inhibition have the qualitative properties to support surround suppression in pixons more than in on alphas. So it's in inhibition or excitation. But how do we know which one it is and which one's more important? Is excitation or inhibition more important in driving? can play the same game with dynamic lamp because remember we can record the excitatory conductances and the inhibitory conductances but now we can flip them individually so what if we so this is all in picks on now because we know that the picks on conductances are the ones that drive surround suppression but what if we show what if we inject excitation from a small spot and inhibition from a large spot or excitation from a large spot and inhibition from a small spot. Like which one is gonna control the surround suppression? So here's the answer to that. So in this case, we're keeping inhibition constant and varying excitation in the dark trace from 200 micron spot and in the lighter trace from a 1200 micron spot. And you can see the spiking goes down enormously when we vary excitation. What happens when we vary inhibition? Very small effect. Right, so you very you put that more inhibition in, it definitely gets more inhibition for large spots, but that turns out to be a much smaller effect than the excitatory effect. Okay, and that's quantified here. When we vary excitation, we have a huge surround suppression. When we vary inhibition, we have a small amount, about thirty percent surround suppression. So. Decreases in excitation for large spots drive surround suppression. Increases in inhibition have a much smaller effect. Now, just to be clear, that does not mean that inhibition is not important in this cell. It has a very interesting inhibition pattern. Daniel's paper was about that. It just is probably not so much for this in these conditions, right? The inhibition may have a lot to do with motion and may have to do with lots of stimuli we didn't check, but for this particular computation and these conditions, surround suppression seems to be mostly run by excitation. Okay, so now we can mostly cross off inhibition and focus on excitation, but now we get to another critical ubiquitous question in neuroscience, presynaptic or postsynaptic. Let me flesh that out a little more. It could be the case that the bipolar cells are releasing approximately the same pattern of glutamate onto pixons and on alphas, but the difference is in their glutamate receptors. Well, the pixon has one type, on alpha has a different type. They could saturate at different points, they could have different kinetics, there could be a lot of differences in their actual glutamate receptors. How could that lead to surround suppression? Let me take you through a thought experiment. This is not data, this is a thought experiment about how that could impact surround suppression. Let's imagine for a moment that bipolar cell glutamate release, which is shown in the black trace, has surround suppression. Okay, so it has very large glutamate. The bipolars release a lot of glutamate for a 200 micron spot and much less for a 1200 micron spot. So that's the black trace. If you've got high saturation or desensitization thresholds in your glutamate receptors, then your excitatory input is going to pretty much follow the bipolar cell glutamate release. So you have a blue curve that basically follows the black curve. But now on the right, imagine that you have low saturation or desensitization thresholds and you are just saturated at 30 or 40% of the glutamate release from the bipolar cell. Now you get a squashed flattened curve that's shown on the right. In that situation, 
your ganglion cell excitatory response would have very little surround suppression, even though the glutamate input onto it does have surround suppression, okay? So this would be a case where the receptors themselves cause it to not have surround suppression, even though the release of the bipolar cell did. So if that were the case, we should see that in the on alpha, right? The, the situation that I'm drawing on the right here is the on alpha situation, right? So let's test that. The, um, this, this uh, first of all, all credit to Steve DeVries on this experiment. He suggested this, which I thought was a brilliant idea, which how could we test that? We can actually do it with low dose glutamate receptor antagonists and on alphas. So if you put AMP receptor blockers uh, like NBQX or kynurinate onto a, a ganglion cell, of course, if you put them at high enough concentrations, you lose all excitatory responses. But what if you put it at a low dose, either competitive or non-competitive antagonist? You should raise that desensitization threshold, right? You should reveal surround suppression if it was absent because of this desensitization or, or saturation. So that's the experiment we did. We put these drugs on. And as you can see, of course, our excitatory responses got smaller. But did we reveal surround suppression? We didn't at all. Right now, so the best spot size and the largest spot size still have almost identical responses, <laughs> even after adding this glutamate receptor antagonist. That's quantified here. If anything, the suppression goes in the opposite direction. So we don't gain surround suppression, we lose surround suppression by putting either of these drugs on. So we can conclude then that the differences in surround suppression at these synapses appear to be a presynaptic effect. So receptor satur saturation or desensitization is not at play. So we can put our next X on the board, which means now we're at this situation where we have the same receptors, but we have different glutamate release onto the two ganglion cells. That's fine because we know there's different bipolar cells in the retina, right? The easiest way to explain this is, to, is that these ganglion cells get different bipolar cell inputs. So these are the on bipolar cells of the mouse retina. This is one of the beautiful things about working in the retina. We actually know all the bipolar cell types. So this is a solved problem. There's eight of them. There's eight on bipolar cells. And because of the stratification profiles where the dendrites of these two cells are, we know that the only options really are six, seven, eight, and nine. So this is a diagram of the IPL, and this is the stratification pattern of the pixons and the on alphas shown in the two different colors. And first of all, you can see they're basically identical, and they're down below the on chat band which means that they can't contact the fives, but they can contact the six, sevens, eights, and nines. All right, so how can we know? So we've, we've at least solved the problem to some degree, we've knocked out half of them, but what set of six, sevens, eights, and nines contact both of these cell types? So we worked on this problem for a while. We did a bunch of immunohistochemistry like I have in previous papers to answer this problem. But I'm gonna skip all that and take you to the most definitive way you can answer it, which is with a physiologically registered EM experiment. So let me take you through how this works. This is, you fill functionally identified pixons and on alpha. So this, is all credit to David for pulling off this pretty amazing experiment. So you have to find a pixon and an on alpha right next to each other with no transgenic labeling, just because of how they're responding. So he searches around, he finds an on alpha and a pixon in close proximity to each other. Then he fills them both with Alexa 488 and that's shown in cyan here. We do this in a line in which type six bipolar cells, which I've shown previously are the dominant input to on alphas are labeled. This is a CCK Cree line and they're labeled purple in this image. And then what he does is burns a square with the two photon laser for EM alignment. This is called NERBING, near infrared branding. <laughs> um, and that's shown in white. And then he takes a high resolution confocal image of this region where the dendrites overlap, which is shown in the dotted box here. And then we fix the tissue and send it to Rachel for serial block face EM 3D reconstruction. 
so we can know which dendrites belong to which cell and find all the bipolar cells. This is what this looks like once you've done it. So here's the picture of the two cells. In white is the region that was reconstructed in the 3D EM, and that's the same cells in the EM. So it's even though they're the same color and there's no color contrast in the EM, it's totally obvious which dendrites belong to each ganglion cell because you can trace them back and compare them to the confocal image. So we can pseudo color the dendrites orange and purple. And now we can trace every bipolar cell input to both of the cell types. By morphology, you can identify type six, seven, eight, and nine bipolars. And this is what Wan Ching and Rachel's lab did. And the answer is on the right. Here's the distribution of synapses from the four bipolar cell types onto the on alpha and the pixon. And they're remarkably similar, right? Very slight differences. And you can run through the map, math. I mean, if type six and type seven vary as much as they possibly could in surround suppression, that amount of difference, that like 5% difference there doesn't have any chance at, at, doing, at explaining the amount of surround suppression difference we saw in excitation. So they get approximately the same distribution of bipolar cell types. And if you look closer, they actually get inputs from the very same bipolar cells. So this is a, bi this is a type six bipolar cell in gray here. And these are these incredible EM images where I hope I can convince you, you can actually see the ribbon in all the vesicles. There's no question these are synapses, not just contacts. And this is the same type six bipolar cell making synapse one onto a picks on and synapse two onto an on alpha or vice versa. So individual bipolar cells definitely synapse onto both ganglion cell types. Okay, so now we're at the uncomfortable part. Let me take you through the evidence here. Where we look for the source of differences in surround suppression between pixons and on alphas. We showed that it's not intrinsic properties, right? Dynamic clamp showed that suppression follows the synaptic inputs, not the cell identity. Then I showed you that inhibition is not all that important. Surround suppression comes mostly from excitation, but regardless, the excitation is different to the two cells, whether you believe it's functionally important or not, there's clearly different excitation to the two cells. But different glutamate receptors don't explain the difference in surround suppression because weak antagonists didn't increase surround suppression at all alphas. So saturation and desensitization are not at play. So, that means these cells get different glutamate input from bipolar cells, but it's not different bipolar cells. So the bipolar cell input distribution is nearly identical and individual bipolar cells synapse onto both ganglion cell types. So what are we left with? Could the same bipolar cell release glutamate differently from two different synapses? So this is what this would look like. This is a bipolar cell that's synapsing onto an on alpha and it picks on. But as many as the experts in the audience will know, the synapse is complex. It's not just like this. There's another player involved. These are dyad synapses, which nine times out of 10 have an amacrine cell sitting here as well, right in proximity. So maybe there's different amacrine cells that are present at these synapses with pixons versus on alphas. So again, we turned to the EM and we looked. Granted, this, this is very incomplete, but let me just show you what we were able to see. So again, since they're physiologically identified, we have a unique opportunity to say what's a type six to pixon synapse and what's a type six to on alpha synapse. So we can separate our synapses into those two different categories and then look at who else is at the diet and start tracing that amacrine cell process back. So that's what's shown in cyan here is a piece of a wide field amacrine cell at one of these pixon, type six to pixon synapses. And if you group them into the ones that are at the type six to on alpha versus the type six to pixon synapses, you get colorful spaghetti, but the colorful spaghetti doesn't look all that different between the two types, as far as we can tell. It seems that most of the amacrine cells are wide field, granted, you can't trace an entire amacrine cell in this volume, right? It's just a piece of an amacrine cell. So I am not claiming that these are the same amacrine cells, but 
we don't have enough evidence to reject the null hypothesis that they are. There's not clear morphological differences between the amacrine cells, at least. And we looked at a lot of other things that I don't have time to show you, the size of the number of vesicles, the volume of the synapse, the distance of the synapse from the branch point. We looked at a lot of things and didn't find statistically significant differences morphologically between these synapses, except for this one which is a kind of weird one, but let me just tell you what it is. If you look at the ribbon, so the synapse from the bipolar cell onto the ganglion cell, and then you look at the nearest inhibitory synapse, so how close is the nearest inhibitory synapse? It is closer in pixons than it is in all alphas. Very statistically significantly so. P is 10 to the minus four. So they're definitely closer, but look at the scale on the y-axis. We're talking about 700 nanometers versus one micron. So they're different, but they're different at a very, very small spatial scale. Don't know what that means. We'll get back to it at the, in the last slide, but that's what, that's what we saw. So all amacrine cells that could be identified at each dyad were either wide field or medium field. There's a few medium field ones in here, but we weren't able to really tell their differences. But what about pharmacology? So we can also block them with different drugs. And so now we're in pixons again, we're measuring the excitatory conductances. Remember excitatory conductances are the ones that matter, but then we can put on inhibitory receptor antagonists to knock out the potential effects of some of those amacrine cells. So if we do that with all of our favorite drugs, GABA C, GABA A, GABA B, glycine receptors, um, and voltage-gated sodium channel antagonists, this is the result, which is that you can see a change in surround suppression when you black GABA-C receptors or voltage-gated sodium channels with TTX. But there's no effect of GABA-A receptors, GABA-B receptors, or glycine receptors. So this isn't super conclusive, but it is saying that the circuit that is involved in surround suppression likely involves gaba C receptors and spiking amacrine cells. So some of those wide field spiking amacrine cells that are, were present at all those dyads likely have something to do with this circuit that's causing surround suppression. Okay, but the fundamental question here is whether bipolar cell synapses can be the independent computational units. I said that what is the computational unit of the computation, what is the single unit of the computation is one of these core questions. So that's what I'm gonna to turn to now. It's not surprising for those of you who study other systems that neurons can have distinct computational units in different compartments. It's well known that there's different signals in the basal and apical dendrites of a pyramidal cell. That's part of the computational structure of these cells. But, for scale, there's a retinal bipolar cell, right? The apical, this is the same animal, right? A mouse pyramidal neuron, the apical and basal dendrites of a pyramidal cell are hundreds of microns apart. A retinal bipolar cell is one of the very smallest neurons in the entire central nervous system. So let's think about how this could happen whether ribbons can experience different voltages depends on the electrotonic length constant, how far voltage spreads within the neuron. And the equation for that is quite simple in a passive case. The length constant lambda is the square root of Rm over Ri. Rm is the membrane resistance and Ri is the internal resistance. You can measure membrane resistance with patch clamp recordings of bipolar cells. Espen Hartfight has done some beautiful work on that and given us some excellent numbers. And RI is assumed to be basically a constant. It's the, um, it's the internal resistance of cytoplasm inside a neuron. Granted, we can mess around with that value a little bit and I'll show you what we have. But if you take the standard value for RI, Lambda is 780 microns. Look at our scale again. How could, if lambda is 780 microns, there's no way that 
that ribbons that are five, 10, 20 microns apart from each other could have substantially different voltages. So David worked on this a lot and built an entire neuron model. So we were like, okay, but, but bipolar cell is not passive. It's got lots of active conductances and it's not just a tube. Let's be a lot more real about this. So we took our EM reconstructions from Rachel. This is one in which she's annotated every watching has annotated every ribbon output and every inhibitory input onto the terminal. So just for reference, I mean, look at the scale bar here. This thing is about 15 microns across. And within that 15 microns, it has 91 ribbon outputs and 120 inhibitory inputs. So this is a complex little machine. And David made a reconstruction of the entire thing, put in as many active conductances as he could find with parameters in the literature, did a full robustness test to varying all those parameters, messed with RI by a factor of 10 or 20. And bottom line, so this, so this is what this simulation kind of looks like. You, you start the bipolar cell at its resting membrane potential, which is about minus 42, you put in, excitation from the dendrites, from the cones where the bipolar gets the input that depolarizes the cell. And then you inhibit a single one of those 120 sites. Okay, you put very strong inhibition at a single place shown by the red arrow. And then you measure for every ribbon, how much does that inhibition impact the voltage? Okay, so you look at the decay of that inhibition as a function of distance to the different ribbons. So David did this and here's the result. In a passive model, this is now using the real neuron but not using active conductances, you get very close to the number we got that from Espen in a rat rod bipolar cell. So, you know, slight differences because of the morphology and it being accurate, but basically the length constant is 600 microns and at a small spatial scale, there's no possible way two ribbons can have a different voltage. This, by the way, is the distribution of the distances between the ribbons and it peaks at 25 microns. So on the same scale there, you see the difference is 99% you know, of the voltage at one ribbon to the next one. What about an active model? So this is what I was hoping was gonna be the answer. David added as many active conductances as he could, really kind of pushed it to the limits. It's still 117 microns. So it's really, you know, I wanted this to work. I wanted it to be that there was some kind of voltage explanation and there was gonna be some really cool trick with the active conductances that caused this to work. But I just don't think it's possible. And I was thinking for a while, maybe what we need to do is just increase our eye a lot. Maybe there's a lot of gunk down there. There's a lot of endoplasmic reticulum. There's a lot of vesicles. Maybe ions just don't flow very well at this terminal. But first of all, I mean, look at the equation. It's in the denominator with a square root. I mean, if you're going to change the length constant by a factor of 10, you need to change ri by a factor of 100. And second of all, if it was really that high, not, signals would never make it down from the dendrites, right? It's like saying you've gunked up your whole bipolar cell terminal such that ions can't flow. You'd never get any reasonable conductance down from the dendrites to the ribbons in the first place if RI was really a hundred times higher than it is, than we estimated it to be. So <laughs> in conclusion, I don't think there's a voltage gradient. <laughs> so while we were working on this actually, um, Kaisuke in Hara's lab had this, had this really beautiful paper where they claim that there's different direction tuning and glutamate release from nearby butons in the same type seven bipolar cell. So this was with glutamate imaging with iGlue sniffer, and you can see a similar scale. They segment in panel H there, they're different type seven bipolar cell terminals, and they claim that there's different preferred direction responses two, three microns apart from each other. And just like us, they saw that the path length between the outputs of these bipolar cells peaks at 25 microns. So the distance between these ribbon outputs is about 25 microns in a reasonably tight distribution. But they also calculated a path length from that same equation of 780 microns. 
So their conclusion was that we don't know how this works either, but we see some evidence that it does. So I, I wish I had a better answer for you than this. I wish I could tell you how it works. We're gonna hopefully talk about that and speculate about that together. But let me just take a step back to the bigger picture here. I tried to answer the question, is the computational unit of excitation in the retina the bipolar cell or the bipolar cell synapse? There's 15 bipolar cell types in the mouse. You know, I was just saying to Tom before this that I was hoping that this was the kind of problem that we could solve with some math. If there's 15 flavors of excitation in the retina and 42 ganglion cells, we can measure the excitatory currents to each of the 42 ganglion cells, do a linear combination model or nonlinear combination model of each of the bipolar cell types that could input it. And we could actually have a really great description of the excitatory currents to every ganglion cell. It's a lot of recordings, but it's theoretically solvable. But I don't think that's the case anymore. I think there's not 15 flavors of excitation in the retina. I think there's hundreds because there's 40 to 80 amacrine cell types. And if they're modifying the bipolar cells locally, we get a picture much more like what was diagrammed in this paper in 2012. So <laughs> where do we go from here? Um, many aficionados in the audience would uh, ask, of course, the first question, Kaisuke did this with, with iGlucinifer, why aren't you doing that? Oh boy, did we try <laughs> getting good, Iglucinifer expression in bipolar cells is very hard. We fought with viruses for a couple of years and we haven't really gotten very good signals yet. But at the end of the day, I don't know that I even believe it anyway. I mean, we, we could. We would, I'm not saying I wouldn't like to have that data, but if you're expressing glucinifer ubiquitously on the whole terminal of a bipolar cell, remember how dense these things are. How do you know that signals close by aren't actually from glutamate released from different bipolar cells anyway? So you don't necessarily know that the glutamate you're measuring is actually released by the bipolar cell in which it's expressed. So there's that. Um, calcium could help, right? Calcium imaging, you don't have that problem. The calcium, you're imaging the calcium inside the bipolar cell. So you could see if there's a calcium gradient from one part of a bipolar cell to another part of the same bipolar cell. And we're doing exactly those experiments. I don't feel confident enough in the results to show you much yet, but they could go either way, first of all, right? We actually don't know how that, is, how that could end up, but we see some very preliminary evidence that there might be a gradient of the calcium in different parts of the same bipolar cell. But if it's not voltage, then how can nearby ribbons on the same bipolar cell actually have different glutamate release? Now I'm just speculating. Different calcium channel types or subunits or accessory proteins could exist at different ribbons. And these don't turn over very often actually. Some of the presynaptic proteins are some of the longest lived in their nervous system. So maybe this is set up during development and stays like this. Alternatively, or in combination with that, there could be different release machinery post-calcium input. There could be different ribbon adjacent proteins, different snares, different synaptotagmins. But the hypothesis I actually prefer, again, not, not, not necessarily independent of these other two, is that there's local chemical modulation of release by amacrine cells that's not dependent on voltage. Remember, amacrine cells release more than just GABA. So GABA affects ionotropic chloride receptors that can affect the voltage and metabotropic chloride receptors, but those are GABA-B, and I showed you with the pharmacology that GABA-B is not the answer. So maybe the amacrine cells of these various different types are also releasing different neuromodulators that affect things on a very local scale. And I'm arguing for a kind of a paradigm shift in how we think about neuromodulation in the retina. The way neuromodulation is talked about is often it very wide scale, right? These cells release dopamine, it does something to whole circuits and changes at a slow scale, the whole state of light adaptation or something. I'm not saying it doesn't do that. 
But what if it also modifies locally the release pro properties of individual release sites at dyads? So in conclusion, I asked the question, where is surround suppression computed in this particular ganglion cell type in the mouse retina? And the answer is that in PIXON RGCs, it's the bipolar cell outputs that are the key place where surround suppression happens. And what's the computational unit? Not the whole bipolar cell, but the individual release sites or subsections of an individual bipolar cell. So the conclusion is that subcellular neural computation may actually be a lot more widespread than we thought. It doesn't just exist in these huge neurons. It may exist in the very smallest ones as well. Thank you for your attention. Thank everybody. Thank David, most of all, who did an incredible amount of excellent work on this project and all of our funding and all of our collaborators. Of course, Rachel, who did that amazing EM work and Wan Ching. And I'd love to take some questions. Thank you very much, uh, Greg, for this fantastic uh, and meticulous attempt to trace it back to the source, like the observed uh, difference between these uh, two quite similar uh, cell types. Uh, I already posted the Zoom Room link in the chat so people can uh, start joining us. And um, the first question is from uh, Gautam uh, Avatramani. Uh, he, he thanks you, of course, for your talk. And you already touched on it uh, briefly towards the end, but maybe you want to speculate like for his first question a little bit further. Uh, the question is, can we have different calcium channel types to drive different patterns of glutamate release from different branches with the same input voltage signal? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So, um, and so how could we do that experiment? Super resolution microscopy maybe, or immuno EM where we label different types of calcium channels perhaps. So I, I'm, you know, stepping pretty far out of my expertise level at this point. So calcium channel experts, please correct me. But from my reading of the literature, as far as we know at this point, it's mostly CAV 1.3. L-type calcium channels at these bipolar cells. There's not a lot of evidence of diversity of types between bipolar cells, let alone within a bipolar cell. But I don't know that people have really done immuno-EM and looked at a single terminal and tried to see differences. But as far as I, there's, I don't know that there's a lot of evidence against it, but I don't think there's any evidence for it so far, but that's just, you know, the identity of the subunits is not the only thing that controls the calcium channels. There's accessory proteins and all sorts of other stuff that could modify it. And I don't even know how you'd get at that. Now we're talking more fine scale molecular biology than I know how to do. But yeah, perhaps different phosphorylation states of the calcium channels, or so, all sorts of stuff like that. Yeah, and definitely the more you look and the deeper you go, the more uh, elaborate the mechanism will have to be. Uh, so the second one is a kind of a comment. It's uh, the following. Calcium imaging provides global signals, uh, releases driven by micro-domain calcium. So not entirely sure how useful imaging. Uh, <laughs> yeah, totally agree. I know, I know. That's totally true. I, was that Jeff Diamond or someone like that who's worked on those things? Yeah, so... I know we're trying, we're trying to do it at very small scale. David's been really meticulous about measuring the point spread function of our laser, um, thinking about the calcium buffers, but I agree. This is one of those things, if we see an obvious difference in different branches, that I think means something, but I don't think the negative result means much of anything. <laughs> There's so many ways you can get a negative result there. And then remember at the end of the day, what if the biology is the negative result? What if the biology is you get the same calcium entry, but it's the next nonlinearity, it's the synaptotagmin and the release machinery that's different. I think that's also as possible. So we're trying, we're doing this very hard experiment, but yeah, I wanna get people's opinion at the end of the day about whether there is more evidence that you would like for this conclusion or whether this is the best we can do. Right, and people are already joining us uh, in the room. So I would like to remind to our audience that uh, sooner or later I will be terminating the broadcast. So in case you want to um, participate or at least uh, monitor the conversation that will go uh, 
uh, on in the Zoom room. Please make sure you follow the Zoom room link that I posted. The second question, uh, and at this point, Greg, I should like to, I would like to let you know that there are both greetings at the beginning and a lot of uh, great talk messages at the end. <laughs> you cannot see it right now, but I'm sure you will uh, have the chance later on. So the second question uh, that appears is from Anguiera, and I'm sorry if I'm mispronouncing the name, uh, and it's the following. I can think of another retinal ribbon synapse that is modulated quite locally by local interneuron. Can this be a faptic signaling by wide-field amacrine cells? Oh, what a cool question. Juan Angara, one of my good friends. Um, yeah, so he's, thinking, he's talking about photoreceptor synapses, which are a ribbon synapse, which, yes, they can be locally modulated. And certainly a faptic signaling is one of the ideas there that you can actually change incredibly local gradients. And it's one that I hadn't really thought about. I'm gonna to have to think about that some more. Ultimately, the aphaptic signaling effect, as I understand it, its end result is still a voltage though. Mm -hmm. So if you're trying to change a voltage, my argument about the length constant of the cell is that if you do that at one place, you're effectively doing that at the whole terminal. Even if it originates locally, then it's gonna to spread to the whole terminal, but I'm not sure I'm totally right about that. I mean, that's, that's, that's under the assumption that voltage is the end game there, but maybe it's not. If I think more deeply about that, there may be places in which the effect of signaling's end result is something else that's not exactly just the voltage. But yeah, that's something maybe one can join us afterwards. And, can talk more about that idea. Right. So the last one question appearing in the chat is from uh, Thomas Euler. And given that he's in the Zoom room while I say these lines, I'm giving him the chance to unmute himself and maybe ask it uh, directly. Uh, but given that he's not doing that, uh, the question is the following. Maybe I missed it, uh, but what about the pharmacology of the inhibitory receptors on the bipolar cell contacts presynaptic to the on alpha cells? Right. Okay. So we only, yeah, no, that's a good, we actually, we did a little bit of that experiment. I didn't show any of that data. We focused on the PIXON because that's the one where we see surround suppression. So the idea is the pharmacology there is what must be suppressing the glutamate release. So testing the pharmacology of the presynaptic inhibition in the on alphas seemed less important to us because there is no surround suppression, basically. It just responds just as well to very large spots as it does to small spots. So we didn't focus a lot on that, but yeah, if maybe Thomas has an idea in which that, that would be an important thing to think about. So right now I'm multi multitasking in a terrible uh, degree. So there are more questions appearing in the chat as we go. Uh, I would like to ask the people to join us here so we can continue. Uh, the last one I will ask that appears in the chat is the one uh, posed by Henrike von Gersdorf, and it's the following. Maybe a given bipolar cell terminal has a different glutamate release profile at one ribbon synapse than from another ribbon synapse. So they appear to be uh, heterogeneous. What do you think? Right, yeah. I mean, th that's, that's exactly what I'm suggesting, that they have a different release profile. But what, what do you mean by different release profile, voltage dependence of release. Right, and he just clarified that heterogeneous in the sense of vesicle pool size. Oh, vesicle pool size, yeah, yeah, yeah. So vesicle pool size is an interesting, we hoped we would see that perhaps in an obvious way in the EM, and we didn't, but that, again, the ribbon experts like, like Enrique can help me here. Would we necessarily expect to see that by counting vesicles near each ribbon? You, right. Maybe. Uh, that, that would be my thought, that you would be able to see an obvious difference there if there was one, but we didn't see that. Right. So at this point, I would like you. I would like to thank you, Greg, once again for this uh, fantastic talk and for honoring us and agreeing to give a talk in our series. Uh, and I would like to thank the audience as well for attending and this lovely uh, first round of discussion. As we will be continuing with people that joined in the Zoom room. Uh, so yeah, I will be stopping the uh, broadcast now, and I will be waving my moderator rights so we can continue. Uh,
in a more uh, informal uh, fashion. Thank you so much, George. That was wonderful. You did a great job moderating everything. Thank you. And we are officially.